Good afternoon. I am Kelly Brown Douglas, Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary here in New York. And thank you for joining us for another in our series of Just Conversations, where we engage issues of racialized inequities intrinsic to our nation and our collective responsibility to create a more just future. This afternoon, I am so pleased to have with us in conversation Stacy L. Holman of Black Butterfly Productions. She is also the series producer and director of the four hour documentary series that will air on Tuesday and Wednesday of this week at nine o'clock PM on PBS, The Black Church. This is our story. This is our song. Stacy, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us in conversation this afternoon. Thank you so much, Dean Douglas, for having me. This is really a privilege to talk to someone who's in our film. So I'm really excited <laughs> about this. <laughs> yeah, well, it, 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 is, it was a privilege to be a part of this documentary, particularly on the Black church. So I want to begin simply by asking you, why the Black church? This is um, Henry Louis Gates, um, the host of the series, and I'll refer to him as Skip because I, I, I go between Professor Gates, Dr. Gates, and Skip. Exactly. Um, he um, has like a list of films that he's, he wants to do, and this was in that lineup, and we had just finished Reconstruction. I was the director of Hour 3 of Reconstruction America after the Civil War. And this was his next one that he wanted to do. This is a very personal piece for him. Mm -hmm. um, it's very close to him, the subject. I mean, people's faith is a very personal, a personal um, uh, thing for people. So when I had learned or got wind that they were doing this, I was like, okay, um, <laughs> I'm like, all right, Lord, <laughs> you know, I gotta be on this. So um, essentially I, I expressed my interest to him and Dylan McGee and they were like, okay, so you know, talking to Skip, kind of knowing just what the Black church meant for him growing up in Piedmont, West Virginia. He loved the hymns. He, you know, being the history buff that he is, okay. there were certain stories that he wanted to tell. Um, and he wanted to really just shed light that, you know, the Black church is not monolithic and that it's rich. Um, it has many stories and it's very complicated too. Well, that's one of the things, in fact, that I recognized in the filming of it or in the conversations that uh, I was able to have with Skip and the fact that he even engaged me in the conversations is recognizing the rich diversity of the black church, right? People say black church and I don't know what they think of, but they think of this sort of monolithic reality of what the black church is. But it it is about Baptists, Pentecostals and Episcopalians uh, exactly. like me. And I wanna return to that in a minute, but I also heard in your response that you're looking at the black church because it was personal for Dr. Gates, but I also heard that it's personal for you, that you asked to be a part of this project. Tell me about yeah. that. Well, I grew up right outside Cleveland, Ohio in Shaker Heights. And, oh my and my parents, uh, oh, you're a- I'm from Ohio, that's when- <laughs> Oh my God, okay. See, that's, there we go. I'm that's the Ohio connection, yes. <laughs> I knew I, we had a connection. <laughs> it's like that Ohio vibe. Yes. That's I'm right. To be a Buckeye. Buckeye, do or die, all the way. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, you know, my, and you'll probably know this, my grandparents are from Zanesville, Ohio. Oh, which, my goodness. Right outside Columbus. That's and right. my, my parents went to a predominantly white um, church growing up. And it was really Union Baptist Church in Zanesville, Ohio. Mm. My mother's parents' church that really cemented just with the Black church and really planted um, a really deep seed. Um, and my parents' church did something, but that really cemented something mm. even more for me in my walk of faith. And I mean, first of all, as a kid, it's a two-hour service. You don't want to <laughs> be in a two-hour service. My parents' church was like an hour long. You're in and out. Boom. You know, this one, you like, you can't draw. You can't sleep. You can't fidget. You can't do anything because you're either going to get the side eye or something else when you get home from church. Right. But, this is why you I mean, should have been Black Episcopalian. <laughs> <there you go. laughs> Let's talk to in my parents out. about that. I feel like, if only they knew, if only they knew. <laughs> 
So it was just really that community that, mm -hmm. um, I mean, the singing wasn't the best, <laughs> but it was still sung from the heart. It was That's right. community. It was, um, it was love. It was no matter how long you were away from the church, every time we would come back, it was just open arms. And for me, that was really just what the black church um, was my experience and stayed with me so that, you know, even as an adult, I still sought that, sought that community, sought that embrace um, and sought just everything that the black church has to offer. Yeah. And so, you know, that's one of the things that makes the black church, the black church, that it is not simply an institution that one goes to on Sunday mornings to, uh, to worship or to in some way fulfill their sort of uh, Christian obligation, but it is about community. It is about family. It is about a gathering that uh, goes beyond those walls. Before we get even more into that, I recognize that this documentary was in the making well before what did uh, 2019 at least was the time in which I spoke with uh, Skip and with you. And so this documentary was well in the making before this past election. And I am also aware that uh, you had hoped that it would come out well before now. Yeah. But it seems, you know, as we say in the black church, God may not come when you want God to come, but God yeah. is always on time. on time. That there is something very timely about this documentary on the black church now coming out a year or so after your uh, original intentions, because we have had the 2020 election. And what we saw in this election was something that we saw in the 2008 election, the black church coming and its faith coming under attack by mm -hmm. the white media and beyond. And in this regard, it came under attack through the candidacy for the Senate, now Senator Raphael Warnack, who is also uh, in this documentary. How do you see this documentary speaking into sort of the fray of this constant attack under which the Black church and its faith uh, tradition comes under, uh, which is a pattern of attack, particularly any time we seem to find a uh, person who is very steeped in the Black faith tradition running for public office. I'm going to go back to um, Denmark Vesey. Even mm. though he was not an elected official, he was a free Black man in Carolina. Um, and even though there's debate of whether he was a part of what is we know as Mother Emanuel, right. um, because there was a threat, because there was a rumor of you know Black people seeking justice, Black people seeking freedom, he along with several other Black men were murdered and were killed. And that church was torn down. So I point that out because any time I feel like there's a sense of agency, any time there's a sense of power that black churches, a black, you know, leader is trying to, um, to exude, it's a threat. And that's when it's going to come upon attack. Fast forward to President Obama's election and uh, Reverend Jeremiah Wright, which we touched upon in the series. You know, anytime you can use the word, misconstrue the word and pull out a soundbite, it's going to be mm -hmm. used against you. And the black church is always and has will continue to always be under attack. I mean, it's the place of organization. It's the place okay. of home goings. It's a place of weddings. It's a place of song. It's a place of praise. It's, it's the anchor and the center of so much of the black life. And people know that people are aware of that. And it's always, always going to be the target, a bullseye on it, I believe. No, I, th I th thank you. I think you're very right about that. You know, W.E.B. Du Bois said that the Black church is the social center and the religious center of yes. Black life, and perhaps the reverse, the religious center and the social center of Black life. So to attack the Black church is to attack uh, the Black community, is to attack mm -hmm. Black life. And so we see not only these attacks through Raphael Warnock, uh, or uh, President Obama, Jeremiah Wright, but the actual attacks on the Black church, uh, the, the burnings of the Black church that we saw 
a couple of decades ago. So it leads me, you, you talked about Mother Emmanuel, and yeah. we see that, of course, this attack, uh, this white supremacist attack, not simply on the people of Mother Emmanuel, but in attacking the people of, Mo of Mother Emmanuel, they're attacking uh, the Black community. You filmed there. Yes, we did. What was it like filming at Mother Emmanuel? Um, actually, I was a little nervous. I wasn't sure what to expect. Um, Skip had filmed there before during Reconstruction. And first of all, I, you know, when you describe the space, when you're reading, the, it just shows you what your imagination does when you read something. I thought it was a huge space. Mm -hmm. It was a very small space. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the space was just returned to the everyday functioning of the church. They had one area which was dedicated to those um, who were slain. However, it was, you know, not so much business as usual as like we keep pressing. That's mm -hmm. what I, I take it as. And it was still the warmth. It was still a church. It was still, um, it wasn't like an eerie vibe or anything to it. But I still felt, I felt a peace. Right. I felt mm -hmm. a peace that knowing in this space something horrific happened. However, call it, you know, whoever, whatever people's beliefs are, I call it, you know, God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit was there and the Spirit continues to move and it heals. It's the paradox, is it not, of, of the Black church itself? Get that yes. The Black faith tradition was not born out of a time of peace and freedom and calm, but it's, it's, it's the absurdity of Black faith, right? That in Very. the midst of these attacks upon Black life, still on the attacks of Black freedom, still people were able to give birth to a faith that believes in the freedom and justice of God and that those attacks aren't the last word. So the, that you film at Mother Emanuel's church is a testament to the way in which the Black church and its faith continues even beyond uh, yes. that which would try to sort of crucify it. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, if you will. And so, so let's go dig into this. We can talk a little further. We can, we, we talk, you and I talk uh, very sort of uh, nostalgically, if you will, and uh, even glowingly and affirm the reality that is the Black church. Mm -hmm. But even as this documentary comes out in this time and its timeliness, there's also something very paradoxical about it because the black church is not simply under attack from uh, the wider community, right? It's under attack from the black, within the black community yeah. itself, particularly by the, I like to say the Instagram generation as opposed to the <laughs> Facebook live generation, <laughs> in the, right? Yeah. And we're the generation that believes and understands the power of the black church, the, the Instagram generation, if you will, those activists that are out there continuing the struggle and the legacy in many ways of the black church who have said the black church has lost its relevance. It's not speaking mm -hmm. to us anymore. What, what do you have to say to that generation and what might this documentary say? We interviewed uh, Reverend Tracy Blackman, um, uh, yes. who's in St. Louis, and I felt what she shared um, with my colleague, the other director, Shayla um, Harris, in the interview was that the protest Black Lives Matter, that was church. It yes. wasn't this physical structure, but that was a gathering, organizing, um, pressing your point, defending social justice, that is church. Um, I feel too that, you know, sometimes the church we get, like you said, nostalgia, you know, you get stuck in nostalgia, nostalgia. Um, but I feel like there's, there's a happy medium. And I think just as much as we need that nostalgia, we also need that Instagram generation that is burning that fire that know that, yeah, we can't continue to, to rest on, you know, memory and just what we did during this time period, but we need to continue to, to lift the charge. And I think too, I think a lot of people, a um, younger generation feels that, you know, there's still a little bit of judgment when it comes to the mm -hmm. black church. I mean, you, you know, come as you are, can you really come as you are? I mean, you never forget, could really come as you are. You, you, yes, you never, I remember when I wore overalls to church once, my dad almost had a heart attack. He was like, what would your grandmother think? I was like, and, you know, so, I mean, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, and we're not, I mean, 
how you dress and even what you represent yourself as. I mean, that okay. is a huge point of contention. So I feel that, you know, this documentary, we, we pull the rug up, you know, we're not trying sure. to be stuck in like, oh, you know, we did this, we overcame slavery and this. Yeah, we still have work to do. We still have, you know, there's still people hurting. There's still people that have, you know, are angry with the church and we have to acknowledge it. And we may not have an answer for it, but we have people who are speaking to it. We have people who are saying, acknowledging it. And I feel like this series will definitely, in the fourth hour, speaks to that. No, good. And I was going to ask, you know, one of, one of the things, you know, we talk about uh, what the Black church can say to the Instagram generation of Black Lives Matter. The, the, I, the question is, what can they say to the Black church and, and, and to us? And so, you know, I was going to ask, they reveal the warts in so many ways. And so yeah. I like hearing you say that this documentary will pull the rug up. It will reveal the warts because at the same time, you know, just as you, you couldn't go in overhauls, but some people couldn't go. Uh, and, yes. and so that right so that the black church has been a bastion of uh lgbtq terrorism right the the black church blues women couldn't go to the black church billy holiday uh ma rainey and the great women of the blues they couldn't go to the black church they couldn't mm -hmm. be blues and church and so you know in so many respects the black church is striving right to live into what it means to be black church so i want to ask you even as you pull the the rug up what are what are some of the things that some of the myths if you will without revealing all that so we get people uh to watch but what are some of the myths that are dispelled uh about the black church in this documentary well, one thing, as we talk about the church not being monolithic, there was a Muslim imprint, yes. footprint, beginning of time, beginning of time, but Africans that were kidnapped and brought here, um, they were Muslim. There were some that were actually practicing Islam. And I did not know that. I was like, wow. And we traveled to Sapelo Island and we actually see the cemetery where Bilali Muhammad and his okay. descendants are buried. So I think, and that just dispels a lot of myths. I think it speaks to just how people treat people uh, who are practicing Muslims. It's like, we were here before y'all. So I, mean, I think that's like, kind of like drops the mic. So I think that's one of the biggest things is that that, and we knew God, Africans knew of a God, they worshiped God, they had like, we have so many denominations now, same in Africa, they had so many ways of worshiping and praising. So we maybe we were stripped. And yes, we were stripped of, you know, our freedom, but we were not stripped of our belief and of God. And that is one of the biggest things I think people need to understand when they walk away from seeing this series. No, very good. As I often like to say, you're so right that uh, while Europeans may have introduced uh, Africans to Christianity, they did not introduce them to God. Uh, exactly. Amen. And that yes. made all the difference because that became the foundation of the Black faith tradition. My goodness, Stacey, I can't believe how the time is going. So I want to <laughs> ask you. <laughs> I know I'm having a good time. I'm just like, okay. I, all right. <laughs> I feel like we're in a little coffee hour here. And I thought, exactly. Oh, no. <laughs> but this is good. And I hope this energy for those of you who are watching uh, is the energy that is in this documentary. And so I want to uh, tease you in uh, to it because we're only looking at the tip that is the tip of the iceberg. Yes. That is the complexity of the Black church that this documentary will reveal. So as I want to ask you, one more thing before we, we leave this particular topic and sort of connecting back to this sort of next generation. Mm -hmm. What do you see as the future of the Black church? And what do you hope that the next generation of Black church leaders that we are trying to train in these seminaries, what do you hope that they will take away mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what the Black church has been and is? And what do you hope that they might leave behind and bring to it? I feel one 
consistent thread line or through line for me in doing this series was hope. Mm. And I really hope that that's what they'll take away from the series, um, that they'll see through resilience, through community, through organizing, through belief, hope. Hope is what is threading everything that is um, bringing us to this moment. And it's gonna be the same hope of organizing, um, belief, endurance, that it's gonna carry us to the next one. And I think if there's anything to let go of, um, that the church is just one thing, mm -hmm, yes. that the church is embodies so much. And I think this moment that we're in now in COVID, the church is not always going to be in a physical structure. It's going to be this. Um, it's going to be in who knows what technology is down the line. And I think we cannot put the church in a box. We can't, you can't put God in a box. Right. So why are we trying to put the church in the box? And I hope the generation of theologians and, and preachers and teachers that, you know, they will be mindful of that and that they will grow with that. And I think that's one thing what has crippled certain denominations is that that fear of growth. Yeah. So I hope that they will not be afraid of that moment when it's like, you know, we got to change up, switch up and lead as a spirit is leading us. So I hope that is one of the things that they are able to definitely take with them. Thank you. No, well said. Thank you. Now, Stacey, I'm going to switch gears just for a moment. Okay. Because the... No, even though I was a black Episcopalian, right? I went to a black congregation and I knew the uh, mothers of the church of the black church and those black mm -hmm. women, right? And they would look at you and say, now that's, that sister's a bad sister. <laughs> <laughs> so, Stacy, you do more than just these films. Uh, and documentaries as significant as they are to uh, maintaining our history and our heritage, but mm -hmm. you do more than this work that you've been doing with Dr. Skip Gates. Yeah. You also are head of Butterfly Productions. Yes. And through Butterfly Productions, you have bought the story of those that are underrepresented globally, actually, to film whether you're talking about HBCUs, whether you're talking about post-apartheid South Africa. I wanna ask you two in one question. Okay. <laughs> one, why that's important to you and important for all of us. And secondly, you know, we're in this moment where people are trying to, they're talking about more representation mm -hmm. of people of color, right? in film, et cetera. We've, we're past the uh, Oscar so white moment, right? Yes, as you roll your eyes. That, that, yeah. And that was about representation. So I wanna mm -hmm. ask you, have we, how are we doing representation? But really, how do we get beyond representation to mm -hmm. that which is really a substantive difference in what it seems to me you're trying to do in the films uh, that you make? Um, our story is so rich. When I say our story, I mean African Americans. Um, and we've only touched the coin when you said the iceberg, or even the not even the iceberg, just the, the tip of just our history um, here and also globally. Um, and I feel that's what attracts me. And you write what you know. I know about us, you know, and I love us. And I wanted other people to learn about us, you know, and there's nothing more powerful than telling our own stories. And I feel it's really imperative when I have that, that responsibility and that power to, to tell a particular, in the case of Dress Like Kings, a group of dandies that um, dress up every Saturday night. I mean, that's essential and important for me to tell. Their worth is built on how they dress because how they feel and to connect that um, to an audience here. Um, you know, I feel in terms of representation, in terms of HB, HBCUs, um, I was privileged to go to one and I, you know, let Stanley Nelson um, directed that. And, you know, that was important because it was for us and by us. Um, and I feel that just 
you know, we've had a lot of times like this where it's like, okay, we need to be represented. Okay, to be black is to be, you know, is the thing that, yeah, it's a flavor of the month, flavor of the year, and then it goes back to whatever. And, you know, I, I do hope and pray that this is just um, something that's consistent. I mean, it goes through waves. And, you know, I think being stuck at home for a lot of people, we're just kind of really opening their eyes and saying, okay. But I think also two people need to understand that the black story is not just one story. Yeah. There are so many stories that people are telling. And I think that to be represented is to have us represented in every area kind of consistent basis. So it's not just one film um, that's sci-fi and you have a whole cadre, cadre of like other films that are sci-fi right after that. Let's do a sci-fi with romantic, with an action, with, you know, an anime, you know, and they're all black characters. So I feel like, I hope that this season will just not just be a season, but it'll be just a lifestyle change that will just be consistent throughout the rest of the industry. So, I mean, you remain hopeful and you just keep doing the work. You keep yeah. doing the work. Well, keep doing the work. And, and you're right, very powerful. It, it's, it's very powerful when you get to tell your own story. Yes. And as you've said, and it's what this Black Church documentary reveals that not only are we not a monolithic people, but neither is the Black church because the Black church reflects the Black community and it is not monolithic. And so we have plenty of stories to tell and they are all the richer and all the more authentic when we are the ones who get to tell that story. And that's what happens in this Black church documentary. So I'm gonna leave you with this. Done the documentary. You've done more than simply this documentary. You, uh, Stacy, have bought Black life and the Black struggle to film. As you've done that and as you reflect upon the meanings that you have found in all these aspects of Black life and the Black struggle, if you were to close your eyes <laughs> and to imagine a more just society where black lives really matter, what would that society look like? Hmm. It would look like no judgment. It would look like mm. love. It would look like kindness and respect. Where we respect each other, where we love each other despite our flaws and there's no judgment mm -hmm. and forgiveness. Hmm. It sounds like the black church at its best. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Thank you for this conversation. Thank you for your witness. Thank you for working with Dr. Skip Gates in bringing us this documentary on the black church. I invite all of you to tune in and to record this four hour documentary on the black church, which begins on Tuesday night, nine o'clock Eastern time, eight o'clock central time. It concludes on Wednesday night, nine o'clock central time, Eastern time, eight o'clock central time on all your local PBS channels. You will be inspired, you will learn a lot and you will be energized. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, Stacey Holman, for your work in this conversation. Thank you so much, Dean Douglas. I really appreciate this. It was a pleasure.